Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views, trends and opinions from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening we're joined by a guest that's known nationally, probably internationally, uh, by many people in the conservative circles and beyond. He's been known as America's historian and in a lot of other titles, as well as the founder of Wall Builders. Tonight we're joined by David Barton. David, welcome to the show. Chris, good to be with you. Thanks for having me. And so we're going to have the opportunity tonight to talk a little bit about education and kind of the progressive attack thereon and a little bit about Common Core. But can we start by just understanding a little bit about your background and how education mm -hmm. became interesting to you and Common Core specifically? My background in education uh, was that for a number of years I was a principal at school in Texas, taught math and science as well, coached basketball, so very involved in education. Um, but we've ended up, and I guess along my personal educational journey, with all the things I'd been taught in high school and college, et cetera, there was a, a time some years back when I came across a couple of really old documents. And history was not my thing. I was, again, in the math and sciences, so history was not it. But I came across two really old documents, and I read those old documents. And when I read them, I had been taught about those documents in school, but when I read them, it was not at all what I'd been taught. I'm going to wait a minute, time out. I just read the originals, but this is what they told me. And so I'm saying this, this is, and so we started looking for more originals. And so now we own a collection of about 100,000 documents from before 1812. So on history, you know, thousands of documents signed by Washington and Jefferson and Adams and all those guys we call our founding fathers, but also thousands of documents from nearly every aspect of American history. So whether it's judicial history or church history or civil rights history, whether it's constitutional history, educational history, huge collection of textbooks from all topics uh, across the years, we have all of that. And so that's how I really kind of got into the educational realm and the history realm was by seeing the original documents, seeing how different it was from what we're actually taught. So that, that got us now to where that uh, I, I have a lot of state, state boards of education governors, that they have me do the history and government standards in those states, social study standards, which can be from 13 to 16 courses, depending on the state, some 19 courses in some states. And so we'll do the standards for that because once you've been back and seen what the trends are in America for 350 years, educationally or anything else, pretty easy to see where we need to go. And that's the other thing is we, we do a lot of statist statistical work, a lot of stuff dealing with polling, and you can see where trends are going in America, and particularly educationally, what's happening with testing. So we keep up with a lot of things in education. So you're saying that people actually reading things versus just taking for granted what people are saying actually uh, changes that, lives? That's a radical notion. It's I mean, crazy it, it, it's, it's pretty crazy, yeah, to, to actually go back and check sources. And, and, and that's, it's kind of a funny thing because there was, um, I've written a number of books, about 40 books, and one of the books I, I wrote dealt with religion and the founding of the American Republic. And my position was that religion had a pretty significant role. And three PhD professors from universities wrote a book that said none of religion didn't have much to do with anything. And, and so, Somebody sent me that their book, said, well, read yours, seen what you've got, I read theirs. They came up with a different conclusion. And you guys both looked at 1760 through 1805. How did you come up with opposite conclusions by looking at the same time period? Uh, great question. So I went to the back of their book. Now remember, we're, going, we're looking at 1760 through 1805. Went to the back of their book, immediately went to the source page. And there were hundreds of books in the back, documentary books, really good. I mean, they, a lot of bibliography is impressive. But then I started plotting out the years of publication of those books and found that nearly 85% of the sources they used were printed after 1960. I was going to say the 60 to 70 Th time right. frame where there had been a major shift. Major shift. In the way history was that's reported right. as and opposed so to recorded. And so you've got a problem when, when you're looking at history out of the 1760s by reading documents out of the 1960s, doesn't work the same. <laughs> So our book that we had done, about 80, we had about 1,500 footnotes in the book, and 87% of them came from documents from the Founding Fathers while they were still alive, their right. original documents. And you read that versus three PhDs who've only studied in the 60s and 70s, and you get a whole different view of history. Yeah, politicized history versus actual history. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, and that's the thing about history. In history, if you do history right, you're supposed to teach the good, the bad, and the ugly. You, you teach it all. 
Now, if you want to talk about the, the interpretation of it, do that in political science class, but don't do that in history class. Don't start spinning history where you want it to go. Right. You, spend, you, you show all of it. And recently I was in a state working on their standards, and this came up because we were looking particularly at the Cold War era, and they, they really were into McCarthyism. We've got to nail McCarthy, and you know, they want to teach me. And I said, great, let's teach McCarthy, because it absolutely happened. He was essentially censured by the Senate for browbeating witnesses in, in that period. I said, but you also have to teach the Venona Papers. And they said, the what? I said, the Venona Papers. Well, what's that? Well, it turns out that the U.S. intelligence community was doing a lot of intelligence work, and, and what McCarthy was claiming was actually going on. They had documented all the spies in the American government. So it was actually, now, his personal behavior was reprehensible, the way he treated them, but he wasn't on a witch hunt because yeah. the American intelligence. So if you want to talk about his personal behavior, that's fine, but don't blow it off and say there weren't spies because the U.S. Intelligence. In 1995, they declassified what were called the Venona Papers, and that's where it's all documented. So you got to teach the good, the bad, the ugly. Te teach the bad of McCarthy, but don't say he's on a witch hunt because right. here's the documentation from U.S. Intelligence. And the teacher said, no, nah, we don't want to do that. We, we want to do the McCarthy thing. Now you're into an agenda. You yeah. should teach history the way it happened, the good, the bad, the ugly. Right. And so if you want to discuss whether you think that's good or not, do that in a poli-sci class. Right. But don't do that in history class. Right. It's revisionist to do it, it that It's way. revisionist. And at that point, you're indoctrinating. You're not teaching history. You're teaching your personal opinions. And that becomes a real problem when, when the opinions of the teacher are greater than what actually happened in history. Right. And so talk to us a little bit about common core mm -hmm. and I mean because if you're uh, I have uh, I have children ages 6 13 and 14 and you go to the schools and everything else and people and the teachers think common core is a great thing we're gonna improve the standards mm -hmm. we're gonna be more inclusive of people with different learning capabilities and everything else we can't understand why you conservative folks get crazy when we bring up the term common core so talk to us a little bit about the way it's positioned and then a little bit more on the reality of, of yeah. the actual curriculum. Well, the articulation, the ar arguments that you just gave, when people say that now, they're really out of date. Um, because at this point in time, it's no longer you conservatives. Uh, there are now more than, right at half the states of the United States have either stopped Common Core, reversed it, or put it on hold because of the problems. And that goes from blue states, like what's going on with New York, down through red states, like Texas and Oklahoma. It's across the board. Matter of fact, the Bill and Melinda Gates, uh, the foundation, been one of the chief funders of Common Core. And last year, I think it was, they did polling on teachers, and they've decided to pull back from Common Core. But because you're looking now, between 60 and 70 percent of teachers don't like Common Core, and so that's 60, 70 percent. That's not that's not just the conservatives. We're talking across the board now. Right. So when people say, "Oh, it's just you conservatives, you 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 not heads off the right," no, no, no. This is this across the board, and it's because there is statistical, and there's there well, actually there's anecdotal evidence for sure. But there's statistical evidence, and then teachers are seeing it in, in action in the classrooms. And when you throw all that together, uh, it's, it's not a good picture. So, but you have to kind of back up. Common Core is now a very controversial term. And when it was originated decades ago, it was not all that controversial. Pretty simple. Two, two simple things they wanted to do. Because you, you have, we, we have a problem, a problem. We have a characteristic in America of national mobility. 10% of the nation moves every year. So a kid is in Alabama and he wants to move to Alaska and when he was in ninth grade in Alabama he's taking Algebra 1 but when he got to Alaska they're taking Trig. Well he moved in the middle of the year he's all goofed up now or a kid goes from from Tennessee that they moved to California and they were in pre-calc in Tennessee but they come to California and they're in Algebra 2. And, and so the governors got together and said, you know, we can agree on a core of uh, a sequencing that we'll have here so that when kids move around, they'll still be in the same course. Now, all the states still determine their standards. They'll still teach it locally how they want to, but we'll have a core that we deal with. And so that was the beginning of this common core. We, we'll do sequencing. The second thing that happened was the, the governors got together and said, the Constitution puts education firmly in the hands of the states. There's way too much mandate coming out of Washington. And by the way, here, here's a little fun stat. I was talking to a congressman recently, and he points out that between anywhere between 6 and 16 percent of education funding comes from federal dollars. But 47 percent of paperwork comes from federal dollars. And that's expensive. That's expensive. And you're having to hire all sorts of personnel in schools to keep up with the bureaucracy. And so in our state of Texas, one of the measures we had in Texas was we passed a, a, a bill called Dollars to the Classroom. We said we're going to spend 65 cents out of every dollar in the classroom. 
Who's going to object to that? People already think it's happening. Found out we couldn't do that because in our school districts like Houston and San Antonio and Dallas, turns out the ratio of teachers to administration was one to one. One teacher for one administrator. That's 50% so already. That's already 50%. So they can't put 65% in the classroom. They'd lose too many bureaucratic jobs. And so it's not about kids and education. It became, and so they said, with the federal stuff, we want to back off. So the governors got together and said, let's reassert the state right over education, state's uh, ability constitutionally to teach these things. And in and, and doing that, we'll, we'll reestablish constitutional lines of federalism. And so that was the incentive. And it was all good, but it didn't stay that way. And what happened was with the funding, it, it got turned into some bureaucrats in D.C., and then particularly the Obama administration, um, they took the provisions that had been done under, under President Bush, the No Child Left Behind, and said, well, we'll waive that if you'll do our race to the top and adopt Common Core. So we'll give you federal funds. We'll let you out from under the testing provisions of No Child Left Behind. You take the federal funds and Common Core. And so it became an incentive, and a lot of states always want money anytime they can get it. So lo and behold, they take Common Core. But now that they've got it, they're saying, we should have read the fine print before we did this. This is not a good deal. And so that's why now, it started out initially, Texas and, and Alaska said, we don't want to do this. Then it went to five states, and now we're at half the country that said, this is not a good deal. So it's no longer a conservative issue. This has gone across the board for education in general. And so what aspects of Common Core are the most egregious or the ones that seem to be the hot buttons where people bring them up, all of a sudden now it's dead on arrival? Well, there's a, there's a lot that, that tend to tick people off. Um, one is the bad results. You take the <laughs> testing results from, from New York. You take the testing results from Kentucky, scores have plummeted. This is supposed to be a much more rigorous curriculum. It's supposed to prepare kids. And it turned out mm, it's not doing that. Scores are going the opposite direction. And, and part of the problem with Common Core is a problem that we've had with progressive education for several decades now. And that is we don't teach, we, we don't treat the kids as individuals. We treat them as part of a class. So Common Core particularly focuses on the class, not the individual. And here's where it gets difficult. Right now, at this point in our history, we spend on average of $164,000 per student to go through 12 years of school. Right now, $164,000 after 12 years of school, 19% of our kids are graduating and cannot read their own diploma. They're completely illiterate. So if you have 19% of your class that can't read, and you're having to teach the class, you have to take what you teach in reading and drop it way down here, because one-fifth of the class can't read. Now, if you're teaching them as individuals, you can take these kids and keep moving them forward, and you can help these 19% learn to read, but when you treat it as all, so you're forced to, to standardize mediocrity, and that's what's happening. Rather than being able to take people at their level and move them forward, you've standardized mediocrity. And so with the many years we've had a very poor education, this is supposed to fix it. We've actually now standardized it. The second thing is we were told that these were internationally normed standards that were used. And, and they were internationally normed. They just forgot to tell us that, for example, in the math standards, they, they used things that Russia had created, the trig stuff that Russia did. They just forgot to tell us that Russian mathematicians dropped it because it didn't work. But that's all right. We can make it work in America. Turns out that a lot of these things have been failures in other countries, and we're bringing them in and saying, "Well, we can make. We're Americans. We can make anything." And, and it's just nuts to see that. So, just like socialism and communism, we can make it work we, we here can, just it, because nobody in history's ever done. But we're Americans. We can. You know, and, and that's another discussion. But but that's part of it. And then you get into um, what states have found, like Michigan and so many others, in the hearings as they were going through. They found out that if you as a parent don't like what's going on in Common Core in your school, don't go talk to your teacher, and don't go talk to your principal, and don't talk to your superintendent. Don't even talk to your assemblyman or senator. Call Washington, D.C. and grab a bureaucrat and complain to them. And so in hearings that, that state superintendents of public education of various states are saying, hey, if you don't like what's going on, you can't come to us because we, we have to take what they do at the top and we are only allowed to change certain aspects. So imagine the Department of Motorized Vehicles or IRS, how they are so responsive to the people. You know, just, well, that's what education is becoming a common core because you no longer have any local input. It comes from the federal down. And so you have unresponsive, which means it cannot adapt to the problems that come up in local communities. 
And we all know one size does not fit all, not even in the state of California. In many counties you've gotten as big as the state is, what's going on in the inner valleys is not at all what goes on in Northern right. California. So, but you can't, you can't fix that with Common Core. And the problem is, is they're relinquishing local control, whether or not they technically have it, mm -hmm. they're relinquishing it to Washington, D.C., which right. means there is no local well, control. Th there's, there's no easy sol solution for problems. And, and then it's very expensive. Uh, for example, North Carolina is one of those states that adopted Common Core. And because it is such a radical new way of teaching education, you have to learn all new methods. They spent $66 million training their teachers to get ready for Common Core, and that's just generally. It's, it's, uh, districts like Charlotte, they had to put another $3 million in. So every district's putting their own millions in. The state's put its millions in. And then they read it, and they said, we don't want this. This is really bad stuff. Well, they've now wasted how many hundreds of millions? And that's going on across the country. People were preparing for it, and then they got into it and said, this is bad stuff, and they're backing out of it. Well, who's paying for that? Mm, we are. We're, we're having to pay for that. So we have difficulties on, on that side. We also, one of the things that's setting a lot of people off, if you like a right to privacy, um, you don't get that with Common Core. Because c part of what happens is they're using all sorts of data points or, or data collection, data mining, it's often called. But there's 400 data points that, that they're incorporating through Common Core. And so kids will be asked about your health history, not their health history, your health history, your religious beliefs, your political preferences, your hobbies, your income. And so the kids are, are just stacking this information up and they, they say, oh, we need this to be able to, to customize education for the kids. We need to know whether you're Catholic, whether you're liberal, whether you're progressive. We need to know whether you vote. No, no. You, my kids don't need to know whether I'm a Catholic or not to do English. And they don't need to know whether I vote Democrat or Republican to do math. And whether I make 50,000 a year or 100,000 a year has nothing to do with science. And so, as it turns out, all this data collection, schools can make money by selling it to the highest bidder. So it sure. doesn't stay in there, it goes out. And people said, oh no, that, that, that's melodramatic, that's not true. Yeah, well how about Georgia? When they, when they had a bill in Georgia, they just had the hearing on this bill in Georgia, no data collection. Guess who showed up to testify against the bill? Google. It says, we need the data, we, we <laughs> use the data. And so Google's been going around these states that have been trying to, to protect privacy. And Google, of all people, said, no, 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 don't do this privacy stuff. We need the data. So it is being sold. And, and you know, Google itself confirms that just by showing up the hearings to oppose the bills. And, and people say that you're paranoid if you say that that information is going places, or that the NSA yeah. or the IRS or, or, or whatever um, is asking for that information. Nobody's ever going to use it for deviant purposes, right? Well, interestingly, the guy who's called the, the architect of Common Core is, is David Coleman. And David Coleman, speaking to an educational conference, I believe it was in Chicago, and he talked about how that data mining is what allowed President Obama to be reelected, because they used that data mining to be able to target the families, know exactly what to say to the families. And I don't care what side of the political spectrum you're on, if it can be done by one side, it can be done by the other side. And if that data is available, do you really want your private data being used from your kids to be able to affect the presidency? No, that, that's, that's my vote. It shouldn't be my kids' data. Or, or the way that the country is governed, period. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so are there um, specific uh, components of it, the health, the science, the, the mm -hmm. math, the more of the, the liberal arts type components of the curriculum that people are, are protesting most, or is it just well, kind of across it, the board? Common Core really, it, it's got math and science are the major areas. Right. Now, or actually, the, the math, science, and literature. Right. There's no history and, and there's no reading, okay. et cetera. But they call them Common Core aligned because you take the philosophy and the teaching methods Common Core and apply it to other courses. Okay. And so you have a Common Core aligned curriculum. For example, in Florida, where they're trying to get rid of Common Core, their Common Core aligned curriculum in Florida and their world history books that they use there, uh, they have 63 pages and three chapters on Islam, but not on Christianity or Judaism. Matter of fact, kids do learn that the world was really in bad shape until Islam came along to save the world from the Christians and the Jews. Now, regardless of what you think, that's indoctrination. <laughs> that's complete you know, indoctrination. Because you, you would have some level of, of you know, equality of teaching. So, but that's a common core line textbook. You see the same thing in the Common Core aligned things that they've done for the AP U.S. History Test. 460,000 kids take that in a year. And 142 pages of what you'll teach for the AP U.S. History Test 
It is absolute indoctrination. You do not get a military battle, period, not in the American Revolution, not in the Civil War, not in World War II. There was no D-Day. There was no Battle of Midway. There was no Hitler. There was no Holocaust. How can you go through an AP U.S. history course and not have that? There was no Patton. There was no Eisenhower. There, there was no MacArthur. Those guys are all gone. As it turns out, in the 142 pages, you do not get any military history, no military heroes, no Medal of Honor winners, no valor, no military battles. Um, you lose civil rights. MLK is gone. Rosa Parks is gone. You lose the American Revolution. It's out. Founding fathers are gone. Out there. So that's indoctrination. I mean, these are all major parts of American history, and you don't have to be conservative or liberal to say that we ought to be teaching this stuff. What replaces it? Uh, what replaces it? Here's a great example. If you hate America, you'll love, you'll love <laughs> the Common Core. Um, while they do not teach anything about World War II, they do make the comment that dropping the atomic bomb on Japan raised questions about American values. So what you get is Hitler didn't do anything. We didn't save the world from Hitler, but we dropped the atomic bomb and those wicked Americans. And you go, time out. Most people don't know what's called uh, Operation Downfall. After we did D-Day, we said, you know, we've got to take out Japan now. So all, all the estimates from all the allies were it's going to be somewhere between 3 and 14 million people killed if we invade Japan. Uh, 500,000 Americans was the estimate. Harry Truman looks at that and says, no way. And so he dropped two bombs. Those two bombs took out 150,000 people and 150,000 more with radiation. 300,000 total people lost. That ends it. 300,000 versus up to 14 million. So tell me what the problem with American values are on this. Mm -hmm. Plus, we rebuilt them afterwards. They've now got one of the strongest economies in the world, one right. of the most free nations. What's the, so what you get is a steady dose of everything that could possibly be wrong with America, even if you have to concoct it and you don't get traditional American history. Which is a shame should be American history in American history, but it's not. Oh, there you go, wanting people to use it's the right logical. words I'm for, the, I'm for the actual description. I didn't mean to be logical. My, uh, my bad. It, yeah, well, that's not very common core-ish of you. So. It's not very common sense either. No, so, so uh, people uh, around the country know you're a wealth of knowledge, but how can they find out more about Common Core, about you and the things that you're working on? Do you have a website you'd like to direct we do. them to? WaltBuilders.com, we have that. We have a ton of information on Common Core and other things there. We also have a website called HaltCommonCore.com, and that keeps you up with what's going on in every state. It shows you the groups in your particular state that are working on the Common Core issue and where there's legislative in your state, so we monitor all the states. Perfect. Well, thank you for sharing that, Dave. If you'll hold on for just a moment, we'll be back after a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. The Conservative Forum of Silicon Valley began with 20 conservatives meeting at a restaurant in November of 2003. Our mission is to promote the principles of American liberty through education. By 2012, we had grown to over 600 paid members. Our monthly meetings feature well-known and prestigious conservative speakers addressing issues that are critical to our country's very survival. This includes speakers like Victor Davis Hanson, Andrew Breitbart, David Horowitz, and many others. In addition to our monthly meetings, we sponsor a conservative local cable access TV show, The Right Side, covering today's topics. Our Constitution Discussion Group not only teaches the Constitution, but started our annual essay contest that awards two $1,000 scholarships to local high school seniors. We are a virtual clearinghouse for grassroots organizations by providing them with table space at no charge in our exhibit area. There are typically a dozen groups represented. If you are like-minded, join us at our next meeting and become motivated and empowered. Liberty made in America. And that was a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. And we appreciate them underwriting the show because it makes it all possible and we get to have great guests on our show, often because these are guests that are going to be speaking at the Conservative Forum. Uh, normally on the second Tuesday of each month, we meet at 432 Stearland Road, about three minutes from here, right in Mountain View. And this evening, the reason we were able to have Dave Barton on the show is because he'll be speaking uh, to the group about Common Core. And in March, we've got Dennis Michael Lynch, producer of They Come to America. In April on the 14th, it's a joint event with Hillsdale College, and that'll be John J. Miller that will be speaking there. 
In May, uh, Colonel Alan West will be speaking. And in June, Catherine Engelbrecht, founder of True the Vote, will be there. If you have uh, questions or you'd like to know more information about the forum, you can go to theconservativeforum.com for more information. And in closing, I'd like you to just take a little bit of time and do your research. Educate yourself about Common Core and figure out if it really is aligned with the best interest of the country, of the state, of our local uh, school districts. But most importantly, if you have children or grandchildren in the system, take a look for that reason, because you want to make sure that the things that are put into your young one's minds are the right things, mm -hmm. accurate things, historically, um, as well as better aligned with your belief systems of having truth <laughs> in the education system. At that, we'd like to say thanks again for joining us on The Right Side. I've been your host, Chris Pereja, and we look forward to seeing you again in person or on the show sometime soon. If you just can't wait that long, reach out to us at TV at gmail.com and have a great night.